Welcome back, everyone. We have lost some participants over the break, but I suspect that they will just join in a few minutes again. But um, happy that all of you are back. And we will start off this last session already of short presentations with a presentation by Timo Heister and Jachi Jan about efficient matrix-free solvers in Aspect. So please, Timo, take it away. All right, thank you, Rene. Uh, thank you all for coming and listening. Um, so this session is a little bit different because it were, it's, it highlights uh, numerical aspects. Um, and um, I hope to make it interesting for everybody here um, by, by trying to give the high level overview um, and um, encouraging you to try these things out uh, that we have been working on. Um, this has been supported by not only by CRG directly, but also by the NSF directly and other, and other companies to work on this. This is a multi-year effort by many people to, to get efficient linear solvers um, in DO2 and then in return in, into Aspect. So um, I don't think I need much of a motivation, but just for completeness sake, um, when you solve problems in Aspect, most of the time, the Stokes solve is the most expensive part. Um, so the coupled velocity pressure system, um, and we separate all the other solves um, from it for temperature and compositional fields, et cetera, right? And we use finite elements, and um, the difficulties are that it is often 3D, high resolution, so you need a large number of unknowns. We need to support adaptive mesh refinement, and uh, we want two things. We want A, we want it to be, well, three things, I guess. We want it to be efficient, so it is fast. We want it to be uh, parallel. And we want it to be also scalable in parallel. That means if you throw computing resources at it, it should get faster, right? Or if you make the problem bigger, it should only get proportionately slower. Um, so the, the time to solution should be proportional to the number of unknowns divided by the number of processes. That would be ideal. Um, and this is a difficult issue, a difficult problem. So let's start by what was what we have done in the past um, since the beginning of Aspect, and it's still the default. That is matrix-based algebraic multigrid or short AMG, okay? And if you run Aspect models, most of you probably run this way. And what happens is that we assemble a large linear system of equations for the Stokes equation. Um, here written as mx equal b. doesn't really matter because I'm not really going into mathematical details. Um, and then we hand this, uh, this is assembled in parallel. And then we handle the, hand this over to Tridinos and there is a multi-level precautioner. It's called Tridinos ML. It's an algebraic multigrid, AMG. And the preconditioner constructs algebraically by looking at the matrix, basically. This is what the algebraic means. Uh, a hierarchy of smaller matrices. And then this gives us a multi-level preconditioner that allows us to solve the system efficiently with an iterative solver. You might've seen the GMRS, that's the iterative solver and the preconditioner is the Trinos ML. Um, and this works fine and it works for all kinds of problems and all kinds of uh, assemblers and settings. And uh, you can do whatever you want with, with, your, with your material model and your boundary conditions, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so it's really nice. It's a black box because we just give a linear system and then this is going to be hopefully solved efficiently. There are several issues with this. First, assembly is quite slow. Um, well, solve might be slower for most of you, but slow, assembly is a slow process. Um, and uh, most importantly, is it requires a lot of uh, main memory. Um, it's actually a limiting factor that you have to go to a lot of processors because you cannot fit the matrix into memory. Anymore. The second thing is if you run really large models, the setup of this preconditioner that happens magically, algebraically, it does not scale very well. So it doesn't get faster with more processors. And lastly, um, you end up with matrices. So the preconditioner is a bunch of matrices and the system matrix is a matrix. And then the only thing you do in the solve process is you do matrix vector products and they are very slow on modern computers, something like in the order of 1% of the peak performance of the processor is used, the rest is waiting for the RAM to give the next coefficients in the matrix. So whenever you run, you run at 1% of the performance that you could run, uh, of the computations that you could do in a, in a specific amount of time. So there's a lot left there, right? To the low, low hanging fruit to get, to get out of this. So current state, AMG, we built matrices. 
And so the title of my talk is Matrix Free Methods. And the idea is basically, what can we do to get rid of these matrices? And that started the whole process of, of all the software development of the engineering and of the design, et cetera. We need several ingredients to get rid of matrices. So the first thing is we have to get rid of the AMG. And the idea is to do something very similar, but do it geometrically instead of algebraically. To explain it in a picture, instead of doing coarser matrices, we make coarser meshes, and then we build matrices out of that. We get rid of the matrices in a minute, but that's the idea. So when you do in your parameter file, you do global refinement three, then we have already a hierarchy of three meshes, right? And we can use this to actually uh, build an efficient precondition. Um, we need certain ingredients for this. We need uh, a transfer operator between these meshes. We need smoothers on each level and we need a course solver. Um, technical ingredients that we need to make this work. This is kind of handled by deal two. We don't have to worry about this too much. The other thing we need though is we need coefficients on the coarser levels. So if you look on the picture on the right, you give me the viscosity in your material model on the finest mesh, but I now also need viscosity on the coarser levels. And that's a non-trivial thing. So for the viscosity, we figured that out. Um, we basically do an averaging process going down, right? You could think of it like we use this as the average of those values here, but you can also see that like averaging per cell might be easier, right? That's why GMG re currently requires a, a harmonic average um, or a Q1 projection um, for the viscosity. Um, this is for viscosity, it's okay. But what if you, there are other things that, that are not handled by the viscosity and that uh, might be more complicated. So for example, different boundary conditions, Newton derivatives or any other thing that, that is special in your equation, we need to actually figure out how to do it. And that's why the geometric multigrid is somewhat limited at this point, right? Um, I don't wanna talk about the details. Uh, you can read the paper or look at the paper down there that describes like how we do this in DL2 and especially how we do this in parallel efficiently and how we handle adaptive mesh refinement because it gets a whole lot more complicated if the meshes are adaptively refined. Um, but with this machinery in place, I've worked with my colleagues here uh, for many years on that. Uh, we, have a, we have an alternative to, to the algebraic multigrid by using geometric information and information from the PDE itself, namely, for example, the viscosity and other coefficient I need to know. Um, with that, we can get rid of matrices. And the idea is instead of apply, building a matrix and then making matrix vector products, we evaluate uh, these on the fly. So if that's the only math equation I think here, uh, if I want to build the matrix vector product A times U with a given matrix A and a given vector U, um, and I wanna look at a certain component, right? I can write it as a extract the row of the matrix, multiply the row of the matrix with the vector and I get the coefficient, right? And I do this for each coefficient. But if we look back into it, what this A is, it's actually dis a discretization of the, of the Stokes partial differential equation. So instead of building it ahead of time, we can also evaluate this operator uh, at, at the time it's needed, right? Um, this is very technical and it's difficult to get this actually to be fast. So for many, many years, this would have been way slower than, than doing what we have been doing, which is building matrices. Um, so uh, we need to actually use modern architecture. Um, so we need to use the vector units on the CPUs. We need to use multi-threading um, and we need, need to use clever tricks to vectorize and bunch these operations up. Um, so. On the smaller level, we do dense linear algebra um, that uses to the tensor structure of the finite elements. And then on the higher level, we vectorize and parallelize and use the, the features of the CPU. And with that, it is and can be much faster because I no longer have a matrix to store and I also don't need any memory to store anything, all right? And now I need to combine this with GMG, of course, right? But GMG, has, if I look back, I need a transfer, I need a smoother, I need a course solve. And so I just need to figure out how to do this matrix free. And without going into any more details, I just show you that it works. Um, so this is running on Frontera um, and this is just the Stokes solve. It runs in aspect. Uh, it's been there for a while. It's been a year or so, I think, since we did this. Um, and this is the MSYNCAR benchmark. And we are running between 6 million and 200 billion uh, unknowns for the Stokes system. That is quite big. 
Um, and we are running on up to 100,000 cores on Frontera. That's not the whole system. We haven't run bigger. But what you see here is for a fixed problem size, let's say the blue one, 400 million unknowns, um, if we double the number of processors, the time to solve goes roughly in half if you follow the dashed line. And also if you double the problem size, then uh, we also need only double the time. So this gives us perfect scaling um, that we would hope for it to get efficient solution. And so this is much better than what we had before. Um, scaling much further to the right and also being much faster. Um, so this is great, right? Um, but that's just the status of a year ago and there's been a lot of work that still had to happen and is still happening. Um, but to summarize, um, in many cases, it's about three times faster, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, you need about 10 to 15 times less system memory. So on a given system, you can solve problems that are 10 times bigger. Like on your laptop, you can solve much larger systems, for example. Um, we scale much better. And there are many limitations, boundary conditions, like different discretizations. Um, we need to right now require that you average the viscosity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are limitations. It doesn't always work. But when it works, it, it hopefully works uh, quite fast. And it's easy to try. So basically, you just set the Stokes solver type to block GMG and hope that it works, assuming you have harmonic averaging. You know. OK. Um, this is the status quo. And um, I now want to um, say a few things about the new stuff. Um, this is a summary. I guess I don't need to show the summary. I'll just go through this. One of the things I've been working on is null space handling. So if you have periodic boundaries, you have a translational null space. If you have free slip boundaries, you have rotational null space. And if you enforce this correctly in the multigrid, then it converges much faster or at all. Um, the pull request is open. It's kind of working. Um, but it has been a work in progress, and I think we have to have to continue working on this. And then for the rest of the items, I hand over to Jia Chi, if he's here. Jia Chi, I can see you in the participant list. Yeah, sorry. Hear you. Can you okay, hear me? Perfect. Yep, there you are. Okay. Hi, I'm Jia Chi. Uh, so right now, we have matrix free Newton software. This is done in the last hackathon and with the help of Mano. Thank you, Mano. And but we are missing multi-level derivatives. So sometimes it, you may need more iterations in the GMG stock software. Next slide. Uh, another thing is this mesh deformation and free surface. So GMG now supports mesh deformation and I just open a pull request about this matrix free implementation of the free surface stabilization. And another thing is we, we are trying to use matrix free method to compute mesh displacement. So when you have mesh deformation, you have to uh, solve a Laplacian equation in each time step to get a mesh displacement. So right now, this is done by AMG, but we are trying to replace this with GMG. Currently, it's 30% uh, faster than AMG with less memory, of course. And so we, we plan to always use GMG instead of AMG. And last thing here is there's a bug with GMG plus mesh deformation and plus elasticity. Uh, we are still working on this. Uh, next slide. And here is some comparison between uh, these configurations by different compilers. So to set up these uh, configurations, you need to add this flag when you build DO2 and then build SBA again. So on Frontera, if Frontera, if you want to use Intel, just load this to uh, Intel and Intel MPI. If you want to use GCC, just load GCC and this MPI. So the first comparison is uh, on one node with 56 MPI processes and the degrees of freedom is around 70 million. From this table, we can see that um, for the soft, stove soft, they are almost the same, except for this GCC plus O2 is obviously slower. And for the setup of the system, GCC is 
a bit faster than Intel. So this is for one node. Next slide. On multiple nodes, we observe that Intel is actually faster than GCC compilers in the Stokesoft. But for the setup of the system, they are almost the same. So the conclusion here is, in general, GCC plus O3 is faster than Intel, but on Frontera, the Intel MPI is faster because it's better trained. Next slide. And here is a comparison with the AMG and GMG. So to get the best result for GMG, like the Stokesoft, you have to use the optimized mode. As you we can see here is about three times faster than AMG. But if you use debug mode, it's, it's a lot slower. But the debug mode won't play too much uh, difference for the AMG Stokesoft here. They're almost the same for the AMG. And yeah, that's, that's all I have here. Okay, thanks, Joshi. So to summarize, relatively soon in work in progress is this matrix free mesh deformation solve you mentioned. We are working on having the correct multi-level coefficients for Newton and free surface and other things also on the multi-level hierarchy that comes soonish, hopefully, working on periodic boundary conditions to work. And the other thing that we might also be doing soon is that we get rid of the averaging requirement for the viscosity because we can actually do that um, if we manage to evaluate all information on all multi-grid levels. And I think our time is up. And so um, I'm just closing with uh, a list of people who have worked on this, a whole bunch of people, especially my two postdocs, uh, Conrad and Jiaqi, who have been putting a lot of work into making this work. Um, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Yes, give a round of applause. And that means we are now moving on to the second talk of this short presentation session, which will be given by Cedric Thilo about finite elements yep. in aspect and in general. All right, do you guys see that? Yes, we can. Awesome. Right, so the previous talk focused on pretty much how to solve a system you get from finite elements. And what I want to talk about uh, is about the finite elements themselves. And this is a work I did in the past two, three years with Volkang. Um, so a bit of context. Uh, if you go to geodynamics.org, you will find on the list of codes, uh, a whole bunch of codes actually, but I'll here focus on the ones uh, indicated by the red arrows. And all of these red ones are actually uh, powered, if you want, by the so-called Q1, P0 element. And I'll come back to what it means later. And on top of these codes, you have on the right another dream team of codes legacy codes almost at this stage, SOPAL, DUAR, SLIM3D, Phantom, Underworld, and probably many others. And we're talking here about hundreds of papers, literally hundreds of papers published with all these codes, especially SOPAL and SLIM3D and all the sitcoms. Um, we can also move on and look at everybody's favorite code, Gale, um, which was a code, or still is a code technically, uh, powered by the so-called stabilized Q1, Q1 element. And not only Gale, but also you have the Rhea code, which did a big splash in, uh, in 2012 with these whole earth models. And on the left here, you have actually my own code and the paper we did a few years ago, also using Q1, Q1. And then I found this reference by uh, Nestor Serpa, uh, where his PhD work also using Q1, Q1. So, Okay, Q1, Q1 is obviously an option. Then we have now aspect, obviously, and aspect, as you probably know from reading the manual, supports both so-called Q2, Q1, and Q2, P-1 elements. And on the right, we have P. Tatum, uh, which is written by, uh, by uh, Dave May, uh, Jared Brown, and Leticia Le Poirier. And it's actually kind of a quote-unquote competitor to aspect. Um, in terms of Cartesian boxes, uh, but it solely relies on Q2 P minus um, one. And all what I've been talking about so far were either quadrilateral in 2D or tetrahedron in 3D elements, right? And of course we have triangles or tetrahedra in 3D. 
And you might be aware of a code called Milliman from 2008, which relies on something called the cruzet raviar elements. Uh, on, the on the top right here, you have something called LACODE, uh, which is an acronym, actually, uh, from 2019, which also relies on cruzet raviar uh, then on the bottom left here, you have fluidity, which relies on the Taylor Hood version of the triangle, so P2, P1. And then you have here dinosaur, dinosaur, or whatever, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, and it actually, if I'm correct, relies on P1, P0. Could be wrong, but I think this is what it is. Um, so, all right. So they all do, you know, geodynamics from subduction to fault to rifting. So the conclusion we might want to you know, sort of draw from this is, well, pick any element you like and run with it, right? Well, obviously, uh, my talk would then be three minutes long if it was the case. So, uh, spoiler alert, yeah, there is a bit more to this than, uh, than just choosing the one you like best for whatever reason. And, um, and in what follows, I'll just be focusing on quadrilaterals and more, uh, yeah, it's actually the, uh, quadrilaterals. And before I further go on, um, I think it's time to introduce a bit of terminology. And for, I guess, most of you or uh, quite a uh, wide number of you, uh, you might not really understand or know what this Q2, Q1 means, actually, or P2, P1, or whatever. And so uh, very briefly, um, the letter on the left with a number has, you know, describes the velocity polynomial, velocity space. And on the right, you have here Q1. And that actually has something to do with the pressure. So it describes the velocity and the pressure. And uh, so this is why you always have a pair, because we solve uh, the Stokes system, and you have the velocity and the pressure in those. And what happens is that if it's a Q, it means that it's actually the product of polynomials in each direction. So for Q to Q1, this is actually for the x component. What you have is that you have a polynomial which not only goes to x squared or y squared, but also contains all the cross terms, x squared y, x y squared, and x squared y squared. And for the Q1, we have the same thing, but then it's first order. So it's the product of two first order polynomials. So you have this x y term here. And um, if we now look at, let's say, Q2 p minus 1, so Q2 remains the same. And here, the P stands for the fact that actually it's not a product anymore of two polynomials. It's actually a linear polynomial. So there is no X, Y term here. And the minus one stands for discontinuous. Okay, and this is, um, this is the simplest way of explaining it, I find. And also when N is zero, so if you have a zeroth order polynomial and it only applies to the pressure, um, then effectively you have a constant, right? Effectively you don't have any, uh, neither X or Y, so you have a constant. And so um, people have been arguing as to whether we should call this Q0 or P0, but it doesn't matter. The only thing you have to remind yourself is that it's actually discontinuous, right? Every element has a constant pressure. And so from element to element, you have a different pressure. And it, you know, unless you have a very specific case, uh, it's discontinuous. And if you want to know more, I refer you to uh, this insane book by Gresho and Sani uh, called Incompressible Flow and the Femme. Okay, so now that I've introduced uh, terminology, we can go back to our four contestants and the Q1P0, the Q1Q1 stab, the Q2Q1, and the Q2P-1. And so the orange dots are the velocity uh, nodes and the pink dots are the pressure nodes. So if I look at Q1P0, we have four velocity nodes at the corners in 2D, and then we have a constant pressure, right? So discontinuous. If we look at the stabilized Q1, Q1, then it has four velocity nodes and also four pressure nodes, Q1, Q1. It's got to be the same. The thing is, Q1, Q1 as is, is not stable and also not, not even usable as opposed to Q1P0. So we need to do something about it. We need to stabilize it. And long story short, the stabilization means that we're not solving exactly div v is zero in the discrete form, but actually some modified version of it. And so we have an additional term, additional discrete term that comes into div v is zero here. And for those of you who remember the structure of the Stokes matrix, normally on the bottom right part of the Stokes matrix, you have a zero. And this is where we put this 
C block effectively, which, which stabilizes the element. Uh, so these ones are cheap, right? You don't have too many dots. If we look now at the second order elements, so the Q2, Q1 and the Q2, P minus one, well, obviously both of them share the Q2 for velocity. So we have nine nodes for velocity in QED. We have the Q1 for pressure here. And that's the default in aspect. The Q2, Q1 is the default in aspect. And Q2, P minus one, actually it means that we have a linear polynomial and which is discontinuous across uh, the edges here of the element. And so usually people represent it like this or with arrows, but right, uh, it's not that important. Um, so it has a discontinuous pressure. And uh, just to remind you, um, if you, in the input file set use locally conservative discretization to true. This is how you switch from Q to Q1 to Q2 P minus one. And also loosely, very loosely speaking, uh, the more dots you see, the larger the matrix you get, right? Um, and so here we have a lot of uh, velocity doffs and, and pressure doffs. So you expect here a larger Stokes matrix as opposed to these guys who are lighter. So. Okay, so effectively what I'm going to show you are the results that we just got accepted before Christmas, uh, the paper in Solid Earth. It's, uh, it's online, you can, you can go and check it. And what we did in a nutshell is implement and or allow all these four elements in aspect. We run existing benchmarks, right? So Donia Anuerta, Sol CX, Sol KZ, Sol VI, they're all in aspect. We looked at error convergence rate sorry, error convergence rates and other matrix sometimes. And then we compared results for the four elements and we drew conclusions. That was pretty much the, uh, how, how we did this. And well, I couldn't resist having this in there. Uh, fun fact, I will not say this sentence out loud because it's copyrighted. Would you know? I Googled it, it is copyrighted. Anyways, moving on, starting with the Donia and Huerta benchmark. This is, uh, you can check the manual aspect, but this is actually a, a unit cube or square with a convective pattern here and a pressure field, which is a parabola. Constant viscosity. Um, and so you'll see a bunch of these plots. And so on the X axis, we have the mesh size. And when you go to the left, it gets smaller and smaller. Here you have the velocity error. So it is the difference between the computed velocity and the, the analytical velocity in some norm and L2 norm. And here it's the same for the pressure. And what we recover actually in this particular case is pretty much everything we expect from finite element theory. Uh, we have a cubic convergence for velocities for the Q2 elements. And we have a quadratic convergence for the Q1 based elements. Very interestingly here, the red dots here do not extend to the left because the solver did not converge and that's Q1 P0. Um, on the right, we have the pressure error uh, for the Q2 elements. Uh, so the high order elements, we have a quadratic convergence as expected. We have the Q1 P0, we have a linear convergence as expected. And also rather interestingly, we have something in the middle for the Q1 Q1 step. It's not that surprising because it's been actually documented already. But so that gave us confidence that, okay, everything quote unquote works. We get the rates that we kind of expected. Moving on to our beloved Sol CX. So the particularity of Sol CX is that you have uh, effectively a large viscosity contrast, right? And there is an analytical solution. Uh, this is the velocity here and nothing happens on this side. And this is your pressure field. And so it's particularly difficult uh, because you have this viscosity gradient. And it's been already documented in Kohn-Bichler et al. 2012, right? So velocity convergence is ideal for, for all of them. But when we look at the pressure, we have quadratic convergence for the um, Q2 P minus one, but it's Q2 Q1 broader is there, right? And once again, it's been documented it's because we have this viscosity contrast uh, the fact that we impose a continuous pressure, right, Q2, Q1, um, then it, it deteriorates the, um, the, uh, the convergence. And so what happens is that in this particular case, the Q1, P0 does better than the Q2, Q1, which is kind of interesting. And the Q1, Q1 is, is on par with the other. So, okay, Sol VI, this is a viscous inclusion, right? This is the case where you have pure shear and you have a viscous inclusion in the middle 
And there is also an analytical solution for this. And it's also um, kind of talked about in, uh, in the second aspect paper uh, by uh, Timo uh, with this averaging thing. So there's a lot here. So the first line is actually the velocity error convergence. And then the vertical here, you have the four elements, right? And what is really striking is that all of them pretty much showcase the same convergence rate, which is linear for velocity and O of h to the power half uh, for pressure, all of them. And we tried the three averagings and or not, it doesn't much matter. It's, yeah, it's pretty much that. And it's not really new. What is interesting is that here we looked at the number of iterations in FTM res and surprisingly the Q1, Q1 stab came on top. So, right, happy. Um, while the others kind of grew with it, but nothing really alarming here. It's just, we know that when we have uh, viscosity contrasts, which are not aligned with the mesh, we're asking for trouble and convergence is really uh, tempered. Like there's, um, we, we don't get the ideal rates. So, so far, nothing really dramatically um, helpful or if anything, I would be tempted to say, well, this one is actually a good contender. Um, because the matrix is smaller and we do, we do less iterations. But now we get to where it gets really interesting. So this is the sinking block benchmark um, and it's really what it is. So this is buoyancy driven. We have a cube here, which uh, is slightly or way heavier than the surrounding. Everything is dimensioned like for earth materials, right? So densities are around 3000. We have a box, which is uh, 512 squared. Uh, kilometers, et cetera, et cetera. So we get realistic, it's kind of a realistic setup. There is no analytical solution, but when we look at the solution obtained by Q2Q1 and Q2P-1, uh, this is in the left half and the right half, they are the mirror of each other. So we'll take this as the gold standard. And here we show the solution by the Q1Q1 stab. On the left, I'm not doing anything special. So I'm using the full density. And if you compare that to this, you'll see that it's wrong, right? There is no velocity at all in there. I mean, this is, there's, there's no gradients. It's just very different. And the other thing we tried is to actually use what I call a reduced density. So effectively remove the background density of the mantle. It's isothermal. So the, the density of the mantle is constant. I remove that and it gets better. We start to recover kind of the patterns we see here. But for a 256 squared mesh, we're still not, simply in the eyeball norm, we're not even getting close to what the other two are giving us. So Q1, Q1 stab already, no, that's bad. And then we looked at the pressure in the middle, like literally looking at the pressure in the middle and dividing it by uh, the difference of density between the block and the mantle. And here in the horizontal axis, you have the ratio of the viscosities between the block and the mantle. And everything aligns on one line, except the red, right? And the red is your Q1, P0. And surprisingly, we don't have one line, we have two lines. And this is a very specific thing coming from the Q1, P0 element, is that it actually, the pressure can showcase something called a checkerboard mode, right? So um, contiguous elements actually showcase a jump, which is spurious, which is not part of the solution, and you cannot do much about it except filtering it out afterwards. But the raw solution, as you can tell, is pretty weird and way off with regards to the other, which begs the question, okay, uh, what if I was using that pressure in my material model? Ask people using sitcom. And the last thing we did is actually run the Continental Extension Cookbook, which is um, in the manual. So you might remember this, uh, this setup. So this is a lithospheric model, um, viscoplastic with the seed in the middle, um, not unlike what we've seen before from uh, Sasha and others. Um, and on the left here, you have the results obtained with Q2Q1. And well, this is pretty much what you would get if you run the PRM file uh, in the aspect distribution after one time step only at full convergence. And here on the left, you have the result obtained with Q1, Q1. And the phase value, it kind of looks the same, but when you look in depth, 
or add depth, you actually see that we have a bunch of weird sort of anomalies there. And when you take the average, so here we take, we take the uh, profile in the average for the viscosity and the velocity, you see that all the elements seem to agree reasonably well, except the Q1, Q1, because it's kind of well known that Q1, Q1 is not really capable of handling um, large uh, lithostatic uh, pressures. And so it actually showcased because it feeds back in the rheology and that's a big problem. So there too, the Q1, Q1 underperforms to say the least. So the conclusion are pretty simple. So Q2, Q1 and Q2, P-1 present the best compromise for robust mantle convection and or crustal dynamics uh, with a finite element method. And the thing is, um, in some cases, they're not obviously better, but I really like what Wolfgang actually, how Wolfgang worded it by saying it's more like a case of a last man standing. The other two are so bad and so untrustworthy that they should not be used or used with very, very much care, like some people have. And so we should just, you know, sort of rely on proven technology and actually uh, sort of stable elements, which have been well studied. So Q2, Q1 and or uh, Q2, P minus uh, one. That's it for me. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that was a great introduction into into finite elements in geodynamic computations and also thank you for the for the work of actually figuring out how accurate the solutions are that we get sure thank you. this brings us to the last talk of the session um which is given by eric van der Wiel about using lower mantle slab sinking rates to constrain whole mantle convection eric feel free to share your screen and unmute yourself all right, do you see my presentation now? Yes, we do. All right. Um, now, first of all, thank you for, for having me here. And then I'm going to start with a slight, slight small disclaimer for the people who were at the AGU or the people in Potsdam who kind of seen part of this talk already. Um, as, as the title says, I'm using uh, sinking rates to constrain mental convection models. Um, but first of all, why? Um, the idea we have or how we think about or how we interpret uh, convection in the mantle is, is greatly varying. It's, it's, it's really different how people think about it. We can have uh, two layered mantle or, or multiple layered mantle. We can have whole mantle convection. Um, we can have a very homogeneous uh, lower mantle or an upper mantle and it can all be kinds of thermochemical piles there, there can be LSVPs, um, and it can move fast and it can move slow. And in all, a lot of geodynamic models these days, we see all these variations and we don't really even uh, conclude together at how we think this all might move. So what is kind of the, the reason for this is, is it's kind of simple. We can't see into the mantle. Well, we can due to uh, tomography from, from seismology, of course, but that's like that's a momentarily slice of how the mantle looks today at this point in time. We can observe slabs and we can observe plumes, but that's only at this point in time. We can't see uh, how it moves. What we do, uh, what we are able to see is the rock record. And the rock record tells us uh, the history of motion of the tectonic plates on Earth. And as Gary has pointed out in this a uh, couple of years ago, a decade ago in this paper, that's everything in between, we don't have any data. Well, uh, Dow van Meer in 2018 came, or, uh, came together with Van Insbergen uh, and Wim Spakman to a new idea about um, linking the rock record with uh, tomography. So they studied um, the subduction initiation and the uh, ending of subduction and compared uh, in tomography and in the geologic record. So from 90 different slabs in the, the image in the lower mantle, they linked that to a known subduction zone, which started sometime and ended sometime. Linking these two uh, times together and combining that with the depth of the slab in the lower mantle, they came to this uh, constraint of 
slab sinking in the lower mantle and it's in bottom average. So in green, you can see the tops of these slabs and in blue, you can see these, uh, the bottom of these slabs as well as uh, their timing from the geologic reconstructions. And as you can see, there is a kind of a linear trend in this. If you uh, change the scale on the, on the graph, you can see that there's an average sinking rate, which is about of uh, 10 to 20 millimeters a year. On the average, it's gonna be 50 millimeters a year, which is an entire magnitude slower than um, plate motion on Earth, because we know plates on, on, uh, on the Earth move with an average of about six to eight centimeters a year, but they can travel up to 18 centimeters a year, like the Indian plate, or even faster, like the Izanagi plate. So there's a mismatch in the, the sinking of uh, slabs or the subduction of slabs, and they're sinking in the lower mat. Um, this is a constraint, so that, 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 that's uh, variable, so 15 millimeters a year, we are aiming for in our models to have that in uh, a sinking rate in the lower mantle. And to do that, I made a very basic model. So, and in that model, we explore whole mantle convections, and we can see what kind of parameters we can track to figure out what, how that can help us in terms of uh, things like mental structure or composition, or maybe even uh, plate tectonics. So in this simple model, there's, there's only a couple of things we can change, we can alter, and that is mainly the viscosity. Um, the viscosity profile in, in, in geodynamic models, we all use them, we all use either dislocation or, or dis uh, diffusion creep, a combination of that, Arrhenius law of viscosities, a constant viscosity uh, at depth, um, so there is a great variety in, the, in these profiles, which is also a um, great freedom to get to these lower, uh, low sinking rates. And I believe that um, so most of these profiles are based on lab experiments like the Corrado and Wu, but they also all have a bit of differences in them. And there's a lot of freedom to, to play with. So my models. Um, it's free subduction, so I, I, nowhere on the model I, I enforce any velocities on the boundary conditions, so it's uh, free slip boundaries on both sides. I use the composite material model, which um, where all the uh, variables come from the latent heat model, uh, apart from the viscosity, which is from the viscoplastic material model. I uh, have some uh, phase changes in there, and of course, and a Drucker Prager yield criterion to make. Um, to try to make a realistic subduction initiation. And so also realistic subduction in the upper mat. So, and as we are geodynamic modelers, we are allowed to show nice movies. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the viscosity profile. On the right-hand side, there is the initial radial location of the particles I track. And I put a link like this so you can track whether where they originated. So all the red dots started at the surface and all the blue dots started at the core boundary. And then I hope my internet connection is good enough for you to have a smooth video, which is not always the case when I'm at home. Um, but you can see that we have nice seduction going on. We have some buckling on the, on the 660 discontinuity. The red uh, rafts on the left-hand sides are continents that I impose there to help one-sided subduction. And they move around freely, as you can see. Sometimes there's a really big slab going down like the one you just saw, this, this big one here, which is too thick and also sinks too fast in, my, in our beliefs. Um, and on the right-hand side, if you track with me, you can see that everywhere where subduction has occurred, you can track the red dots from the initial uh, surface position. And you can also track the blue dots from the initial core momentum boundary position. So now we've run subduction for about 800 million years and the last million years are, are tickling away. And you can see that on the right-hand side, there are still zones where mixing is very, very limited. As in, you can see zones where the red dots are very grouped close together and you can blue, you see blue and green zones as well. Um, but we had to track them, of course, so we can look at whether or not I meet my uh, my sinking rates that we want. 
So, uh, first of all, snapshot of to just visualize the different kind of velocities. On the bottom row, you can see here the radial velocity or the, the directly down velocity or directly upwards, of course. And the circle velocity, um, which could better be named lateral velocity, so parallel to the surface, and the total velocity. On the top uh, two, you can see the temperature and viscosity. So at this point in time, there are two active subduction zones here on the left hand side. You can see the plates move along and this continent in between is also moving. So that means this slab is rolling back. And you can see that there's a, a definite slowdown between the upper mantle and the lower mantle in radial velocity. You can also see that the lateral movement of everything in our, in our model is higher in the upper mantle and at the surface then, then when after crossing the 660 discontinuity. So that led us to a conclusion so that is, it, is possible, it is possible to have a, a somewhat realistic uh, subduction while almost honoring the sinking rate constraint. So after a thousand million years of modeling time, I just picked some particles that have some uh, interesting motions so going up and down. And you can see on the left hand side, this is the position of some particles plotted against uh, the evolution in the model. And on the right hand side, it's the same particles plotted against its velocity. You can see that in a thousand million years or in one billion years, most particles that have undergone subduction only have undergone one single convective cycle. So they move up most of the time very slowly, they move laterally along the surface and then they subduct and during subduction they slow down again. And in a billion years, most of these particles only experience one convective cycle or some particles don't even go up or down. They just uh, stay around somewhere in the model and wiggle around a bit back and forth laterally, but don't show a lot of motion. Um, here's another. So we, we are now running a different viscosities to, to check whether how much impact that has. And you can see that um, this is a bit of a lower viscosity in the lower mantle and the, the speeds go a bit up, of course, the sinking rates. Um, but that also led us to the conclusion that um, we needed new graphs to plot um, these sinking rates. And as you can see here on the right hand side, I plotted contours, the white lines. Um, those correlate nicely with zones with of higher viscosity or uh, lower temperatures. So they, those are the slabs. The contours are of uh, 300 degrees colder than their uh, lateral average on the depth depth. And if you take all those particles and take from those particles only the sinking rate, so th these are all uh, particles that are slabs by definition of 300 degrees colder than their surroundings on that depth level, you can see that we can plot the sinking rate, which goes nicely down towards the uh, core mental boundary, or even at this time, this is uh, two different time steps, you can see that there's a very limited motion in vertical way, which means that we uh, are almost coming to our constraint of the sinking rates. We can say something about how the mental has, uh, could evolve during such a model time. So, uh, my last slide. Um, we are trying to constrain mental convection, and it might help. So, we don't, as we can't see, we don't know what's going on. It might help a lot of people um, if we're aiming to, to use these kind of data in our models. So, we could, it might say something about mental structure. It could say something about composition, which is not in my model. But, uh, for instance, if there are denser LSVPs in the model, it could help them move around. It could um, uh, say something about Bridgmanite and rich zones. It could say something about primordial mantle, how that might be able to be uh, preserved. And, and, and again, this is a very simple, simple model, and we can dress it up anywhere to look at all kinds of different facts while constraining to known data. So that might help all kinds of people like geochemistry, seismologists, and us geodynamics. Thank you. Excellent, thank you.